Hello and welcome back to the ECG course. This is chapter 9. In this chapter we're going to be talking about junctional rhythms. So far we've talked about sinus rhythms and we talked about atrial rhythms. Um, so now we're talking about the next, if you're going inferior on the heart, we're talking about the uh, next uh, type of rhythm, the next type of pacemaker. So we've covered the SA node and We've covered everywhere else in the atria that can kind of uh, create the polarization, create a pacemaker. And now I want to talk about the AV junction. AV stands for atrioventricular. Atrioventricular. So, you know, using some intuition, you can figure out that the AV junction is between the atria and the ventricles. So right along that line there. Let me draw that again. Right along that line there. In fact, to be more specific, it's right around where the atrial septum and the ventricular septum meet. So right around there. We kind of include everywhere around the AV node and the superior portion of the His bundle as the AV junction. And this is another area within the heart that can stimulate an impulse. It has automoticity uh, and it can create a new pacemaker. It's sort of a backup system if you think about the heart's electrical conduction system. The SA node has an intrinsic rate of about 60 to 100. Okay, If th that fails, different areas in the atria might be able to take over. The AV junction has an intrinsic rate about 40 to 60. Okay, And then you'll see that the ventricles also have their own ventricular rate as well, or intrinsic rate, uh, the Purkinje fibers do. So there's a backup system there. If one of them fails, the next one could potentially take over. But it can also escape. You know, these, these other areas that, that have automaticity can also just take over when they shouldn't necessarily take over. So let's talk about the first rhythm. This is what we would call a junctional escape rhythm. Okay, it's often called the junctional escape rhythm or just a junctional rhythm. And the rate should be about 40 to 60 beats per minute. 40 to 60 beats per minute. Because the, the uh, AV junction, the atrioventricular junction, has an intrinsic rate of 40 to 60. So that's why the rate should be about 40 to 60. The rhythm should be regular. Okay, you know, you, you'd also maybe take out your calipers and and check your R to R interval here, and it should be very regular, just like a sinus rhythm would be regular. Okay? And that helps us differentiate a junctional rhythm from something like atrial fibrillation. The P wave. Many different options as far as the P wave goes with a junctional rhythm. Okay? It could be antegrade. You might not have none, like in this example here, you don't see a single P wave. Um, that's because it's probably, the atria still are depolarizing, but the P wave is probably somewhere buried within the QRS here, okay? Um, it could be antegrade, meaning just like a sinus rhythm with a junctional rhythm, you could have a P wave before the QRS, but you'll notice that it may be one of a few things. It's going to, first off, it's going to have a shorter PR interval because of its nature, you know, because of where it's originating. You're not going to have that AV nodal pause, all right? So it could be a short PR interval like that, or it could be inverted, okay? It could be inverted like an ectopic atrial rhythm, but it'll have that short PR interval, don't forget. Or it could be retrograde. It could actually occur after the QRS complex. So that would be a retrograde, and these two would be uh, antegrade here. All right, so the antegrade will either be, uh, it'll, it'll definitely have a short PR interval. It could either be positive or negative. And the retrograde uh, P, P wave is also possible. Or you might not see a P wave at all. So these junctional rhythms can be very confusing because they have so many different possibilities. If you do see a P wave, you'll only have one for every QRS complex. There should not be any extra P waves, okay? And again, with the PR interval, you'll either have none because you don't see a P wave, it'll be very short, or you'll have a retrograde P wave. And the QRS width should be narrow. 
okay it should still be less than three small boxes okay moving along an accelerated adjunction, accelerated junctional rhythm is uh, the same as a junctional escape rhythm except for it's a little bit faster hence the word accelerated okay so an accelerated junctional rhythm has the same rate as a sin normal sinus rhythm so 60 to 100 beats per minute for an accelerated junctional rhythm and you uh, will have the same rules it should be regular you'll either have no P wave you'll have a, an anti-grade P wave with a short PR interval or you'll have a retrograde P wave if you do see the P wave you'll have only one for uh, every QRS complex again the PR interval will be either short it won't exist or the P wave will come after the QRS complex and the QRS width should still be narrow next we have junctional tachycardia okay and junctional tachycardia very uncommon all right but the rate is greater than a hundred just like sinus tachycardia the rate will be greater than a hundred okay whenever it's tachycardia at the end of the rhythm it should be uh, a, a rate of greater than a hundred so with junctional tachycardia uh, the rhythm will also be regular okay if you again map these out with your little calipers here you'll see that the rhythm is pretty regular okay uh, and it's got the same rules as the other junctional rhythms. Uh, the P wave could either be antegrade, it could be buried within the QRS where you won't see it, or it could be retrograde, like you see here, that little arrow pointing to the retrograde P wave, that's what that little dip is. The PQRS ratio, you'll notice you only have one P wave if you see a P wave for every QRS complex. And again, the PR interval, you either won't have one, it'll be very short, or your P wave will come after the QRS complex. So there's many different options with junctional rhythms. And the QRS width should be narrow, less than three small boxes wide, which is 0.12 seconds or 120 milliseconds. So those are your three types of junctional rhythms. You have your junctional escape, accelerated junctional, and then junctional tachycardia. And the only difference amongst those is the rate. The junctional escape will be 40 to 60 beats per minute, your accelerated junctional is greater than 60 but less than 100 and your junctional tachycardia must be greater than 100. So here's an example of a, a junctional escape rhythm that has an inverted P wave and it's antegrade, okay? And you notice that there's almost no PR uh, segment there so you have a very short PR interval. Very short PR interval. Okay, so that's how you identify a junctional rhythm. Again, you only have one P wave for every QRS complex. That PR interval, if it does exist, it needs to stay consistent or else you're looking at a different type of rhythm. All right. And the inversion of the P wave can, can, is very often uh, present with a junctional escape rhythm. Here is an upright P wave, but again, you see that very, very short PR interval. Okay, very short PR interval there. Look at, look at that. It doesn't even exist as far as the PR segment. There's no AV nodal pause. And that's because the atria are taking the polarization almost at the same exact time as the ventricles with the junctional rhythm. Because of, you know, if you're looking at the heart, let's get rid of this for a second. If we're looking at the heart, I'm going to just quickly draw a heart. All right. So this is your right atrium over here, your left atrium over here your right ventricle down here, your left ventricle down here. With a junctional rhythm, your impulse is beginning right here. So it's sending a signal that the polarization wave is going both ways at the same time. And that's why your P wave will, can be buried within the QRS complex. And if it does occur before it, it'll be a very short PR interval. And if you think about the way the leads look at the heart, this also explains that this is lead two looking up this way from its positive electrode. It also explains why the P wave might be negative. This, the polarization wave is heading away from the positive electrode in lead two. All right, and I use lead two often because that is often the uh, lead we monitor the heart's electrical activity from. Okay, let's uh, look at a different example here. Again, we have an inverted P wave 
All right, we have a short PR interval. We have one P wave for every QRS complex. We have a very regular rhythm. All right, we have a narrow QRS complex. And the rate is about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the rate is 70. So this is an accelerated junctional rhythm because it meets that 60 to 100 mark. And then this one's obviously faster here. It's got this, you know, pretty much the same morphology as the one before, uh, except for we have a much faster rate. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. At about 140 beats per minute, this would be a junctional tachycardia. You have an inverted P wave, a consistent short PR interval, and a narrow QRS complex, and it's a regularly regular rhythm. So this is junctional tachycardia. Now these don't occur as nearly as often as sinus tachycardias. And in fact, they're very, very rare. Junctional tachycardia, you typically only see it's a reperfusion rhythm after cardiac catheterization for a myocardial infarction. So it's not that common. Okay, we have a, a real example. Those other examples were rhythm generators. Here's a real patient with a junctional rhythm. And you can see that the rate's about 40 beats per minute. You only have four complexes there. You have inverted P waves with a nearly non-existent uh, PR segment. So you have a very short PR interval, narrow QRS complex. There's no extra P waves anywhere. So this is a junctional escape rhythm. All right, now we're going to talk about uh, supraventricular tachycardias, supraventricular tachycardia. And the word itself, supraventricular, just means above the ventricles. But we're talking about a specific rhythm when we say SVT, SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. And although SVT a lot of times originates from a depolarization wave around the AV junction, it's completely different when you think about it physiologically from a junctional rhythm. And here's what I mean. A lot of times at the AV node, okay, you'll get this re-entry phenomenon, okay, where you're constantly depolarizing around and around and around in a circle. And that's depolarizing the ventricles at a very, very fast rate. All right? So here's some of the rules that go along with this, this rhythm uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Now, the reason it's called supraventricular tachycardia, it's kind of an ambiguous name because it can include a couple different things, is when, when we're talking about treating SVT, we're talking about the reentry forms. There's two specific uh, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, and the one I just described, atrioventricular uh, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, sorry. And those are. Um, AVRT and AVNRT, so AVRT, if you ever see that, they're talking about SVT, and AVNRT, all right, these rhythms are reentry rhythms, and they need to be treated a certain way, and it's very different from other types of tachycardias. So the rate is usually greater than 150, but that is not a hold fast rule. Okay, so don't think that the rate has to be greater than 150. It just usually is. All right, it could be 140 and still be an SVT. The rhythm is very, very, very regular. That is a super important aspect of this. You must measure your, your R to R intervals. And another quick way to identify the regularity of the rhythm is look at the numeric heart rate. When you have them attached to the EKG, Look at your monitor and look at the numeric heart rate. If it's staying within, you know, one to two beats per minute, that's a very regular rhythm. If it's bouncing around plus or minus 10 beats per minute, that's a very irregular rhythm. So you have to use these tools to identify the regularity because it becomes much more difficult as the rate increases. So the P wave for an SVT will either be non-existent or retrograde it'll be sometimes buried within the QRS complex or the T wave because yes, the atria are still depolarizing, but this is such a fast rhythm. And again, it occurs, uh, the, the depolarization wave occurs in a, almost a retrograde fashion uh, that you might not, you probably won't see a P wave at all. The uh, PQRS ratio, if you did see a P wave, you'd only have one for every QRS complex. And your PR interval will be non-existent because 
If you see a P wave, it's going to be a retrograde P wave. Your QRS width should be narrow. Okay, it should be less than 120 milliseconds again. We haven't talked about any wide rhythms yet, but we're going to get to those very soon. So just like I mentioned before, you have AV nodal reentry tachycardia and atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. And again, they're both reentry phenomena. You're, you have this constant reentry going around and around and around because of the pathways within the AV node uh, or between the atria and the ventricles. And what's happening is you're just getting this rapid depolarization of cells. Because when a cell depolarizes, it's looking for the next cell that's not been depolarized yet. And sometimes in that reentry, as it goes around, okay, so if these were cells, let's say these were cells in a circle, okay, and this cell depolarizes, this cell depolarizes, this cell depolarizes, because it's going around in a fashion, by the time it gets back to this cell, well, that will probably be repolarized, and it can continue in that reentry fashion. So it needs to be broken. The cycle needs to somehow be broken. And we use adenosine for that pre-hospitally. And in the hospital, adenosine is, in fact, is almost only used to treat uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, and it's very, very, very effective if given fast enough and given to the right rhythm. Very effective. Vagal maneuvers are also very effective. Um, and in fact, if vagal maneuvers break the arrhythmia and then it comes back, that's a good indication to skip uh, giving adenosine, and we'll talk about that in a, a treatment uh, discussion. So here's an example of SVT. Notice you don't see any P waves. It's very fast. This rhythm is super fast, okay? And you'll see that it is extremely regular. There's no irregularity amongst this rhythm, okay? And you can see that it's between 150 and 300 beats per minute because if you remember our our, our big box 300 rule, okay, if we found a QRS complex on a bold line, say this one right here, we know that the next bold line, if we had the QRS complex right on there, it would be 300 beats per minute. Okay, let me move this out of the way. 300 beats per minute. And the next one after that would be 150 beats per minute. So since this QRS complex falls in between those, it's getting really close to 300, but it's not quite there yet. All right, so here's an, that's an example of a, a supraventricular tachycardia, an SVT. Here's an example from a live patient, all right? This one is just faster than 150 beats per minute. There's no real identifiable P wave, but it's probably in there somewhere. Okay, it has to be for the atria to depolarize. And the QRS complex is narrow. It's a very regular rhythm. Again, it's super important to look at this for regularity because your treatment will be different. Your treatment will be different. If this was not regular, if it was irregular, we'd have to assume atrial fibrillation because of the lack of P waves. All right, but this is SVT. Here's another good example of SVT. In this one, I'd say that th those are probably retrograde P waves right, I'm trying to get it in there, right in there, that causing that little bit of a notch. That's probably a P wave re retrograde, but this is SVT. And this one is nearing 300 beats per minute as well. This is a very, very fast SVT. Typically, you won't see them this fast, but it's very, uh, very possible, depending on the age of the patient especially. All right, but this needs treatment because that rate, depolarizing the ventricles uh, greater than 250 times per minute is not going to be conducive with a sustainable life. So here's uh, something that we haven't mentioned yet, the word paroxysmal. And paroxysmal means it comes and goes. So sometimes you'll hear the word PSVT or paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. And what that means is it wax and wanes, it comes and goes. So you'll have some SVT and then it'll break on its own without treatment, okay? Now for PSVT, for paroxysmal SVT, adenosine would not be the treatment of choice. You'd want to go with something more long-lasting like cardizem because the reentry is already breaking on its own, okay? So giving adenosine, adenosine is very short-lasting. It doesn't last very long. Uh, by the time that this comes back, you know, the adenosine is going to be uh, metabolized. It's not going to be existent. So you need a more long-acting long, long acting 
a negative chronotrope. So PSVT means it comes and goes. It's SVT that comes and goes. So when we're talking about tachycardias, we've talked about a few different types of rhythms. So I want to kind of go over some key concepts. With sinus tach, this is where your P wave will end up, in this area, okay? With sinus tach, with multifocal atrial tachycardia, and with ectopic atrial tachycardia. Now, we know how to differentiate those. Sinus tach always has a very regular PR interval with the, the P wave is always maintaining the same shape, and it should be upright. With multifocal atrial tachycardia, your P wave changes shapes. You need at least three different shapes. Some people say you need at least five different shapes for it to be MAT. And your PR interval will vary as well. With ectopic atrial tachycardia, you might have a normal PR interval, but the P wave will be inverted and leads that it should be positive. Okay, In leads that it should be upright, you'll see an inverted P wave with that ectopic atrial tachycardia. With junctional tachycardia, you might not see a P wave at all. And if you do see a P wave before the QRS complex, it will probably be inverted, but you will definitely have a shortened PR interval. And it might be retrograde. Same with uh, SVT, that's what this is. SVT is the same as saying those two things. And SVT, your P wave might be buried in the QRS complex where you don't see it all, or it could be retrograde. It could occur after the QRS complex. And then with atrial flutter, we call those F waves. Those would occur all the way down the rhythm. They don't care where the QRS complex is, and they occur in a sawtooth uh, pattern. So that's the end of this chapter. We've covered a lot of rhythms so far, so go through and review those as much as possible. Use the internet and Google each rhythm as you learn it so you can see as many different examples as possible. If you want to go back and review atrial rhythms, click on the left image to go back to chapter 8. If you're ready for the wide ones, for the ventricular rhythms, click on the right image, chapter 10, and we're going to start talking about ventricular rhythms. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel.